and they can pull out every rotten thing you've ever done and bring it up and rub it in your face. I've had in, uh, patients tell me, hey, I forgot this 20 years ago. I forgot I ever did it. And they pulled it up and they, they're rubbing it in my face. Um, these, these thoughts are always negative and virtually always lies. You know, they will lie about everything. You know. um, they do the same thing to these patients that the Army does to prisoners of war. You know, they constantly hammer at them. They deprive them of sleep. They isolate them. The first thing they go after is the family. They start saying all kinds of bad things about the family or the girlfriend. She's cheating on you or they don't really love you. Or It's, it's a constant flow of negative messages to try to isolate the person. Okay, And they are energetic vampires. They do the same thing to these patients and really to all of us to some degree as we do to cows. You, know, you put them out the pasture, they eat food, you, know, you bring them back into the barn, you isolate them and then milk them. Mm -hmm. and then turn them back out again. So I, oh, you could say that, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a strange negative symbiotic relationship based on all the prisoners who've told me that these voices would tell them where to get meth, where to get drugs, when to be there, you know, when they ran out of drugs. So these things knew something that they didn't outside their body, and there were so many cases mm -hmm. of that. But in the long run, they were destroying the individual. And, and one thing I haven't fully been able to uh, ferret out is that they, in a lot of cases, they will tell schizophrenics to kill themselves, that nobody loves them, nobody likes them, their life is worthless, mm -hmm. uh, just get it over with and, and kill themselves. And their suicide rate is five to 10 times that of the normal population. You know, and what's interesting is so is that of psychiatrists. You know, and they attack psychiatrists at a rate uh, like five times higher than regular doctors. Yeah. So once these guys kill themselves, what do these things feed off of? Mm -hmm. Now, I've heard of several cases where at the last minute that, you know, the voice would say, no, don't do it, don't do it. But not in most cases. And there was a period of time where I was speaking to the voices and they told me they were assigned to destroy that particular individual. Right. Yeah. And I've heard of some cases where they weren't doing a good job and they were relieved and that if they didn't do a good job, they were sent to somewhere called the pit, whatever that is, but whatever it was, they didn't like it much. Um, yeah. So they're assigned to destroy the individual. Yeah. And, and if, if, you, if you tie that in with Carl Wicklund's book, um, a lot of the cases that he was, uh, treating weren't necessarily uh, the, the ones that would end you up in a psychotic ward. These are more like, uh, I would call them soft possessions. And, and when I say soft, it's because the personality that was actually, the, the demon that was actually infecting the individual uh, didn't have a, such a, a, a violent motive in them. They're, they could even have trivial motives. They just somehow got stuck. Mm -hmm. and it, you wonder if, if when you see a demon that's trying to uh, cause a suicide, what they're really doing, is, this is pure speculation, but what they're really doing is, is echoing what they were doing in their own lives, that, that they wanted to kill themselves. And if they thought that, that their body was now John's body, uh, they're still trying to enact the exact same thing that got them killed to begin with. Um, you know, just to harken back to what, what Wickland was saying, these demons don't know that they're dead. They, they don't know that they're, that they're actually not in their body. They, they think that the body that they're in belongs to them. And that's what causes so much confusion. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know about the suicide stuff. I did talk to some patients who had, uh, for instance, one guy had a motorcycle driver who had been recently killed on the highway and he was driving his bike past that same area and and this voice said you know I didn't know what to do so I jumped in this other motorcycle driver now he wasn't necessarily malicious he, he mm -hmm. didn't realize he was dead he thought he was you know this guy and and he was stuck in there so I've seen some cases like that uh, but in the institutions I worked at most of the time it was you know it was a struggle. Yeah. Uh, they are trying to take over the mind of that individual. 
and yeah. constantly <laughs> driving them to do negative things, negative self-destructive things and isolating them from mm -hmm. others. They don't want any interference. And I don't know anything about, uh, I haven't heard anything about them committing suicide, but one of the things that the patient has to understand, and psychiatry is blocking this, is that these things are not hallucinations and they do not, they're not their thoughts and they don't belong to them. Mm -hmm. If they can't get that through their mind, if they don't understand that, and psychiatry is blocking this with their, oh, these are mere hallucinations, their chances of recovery are very slim. They yeah. need to understand that these are enemies, that they don't belong to them. Those thoughts don't belong to them. And that most of those thoughts are lies and they can't be trusted. Mm -hmm. it's, hard, it, it's hard not to imagine that, that there could be uh, someone or something or some sort of even technology even that that's administering these demons to go out and do what they do. As you mentioned, some demons are told they've been tasked with a certain job. And once they finished that job or before they started that job, they were, they were basically trapped in a pit and uh, it, not to get too paranoid on everyone, but uh, if, if someone was aware of this technology, it would be something that they would want to weaponize and to want to use in some way. And it's interesting because if you look back at what happened with Rockefeller at the turn of the century, we had a systematic takeover of the entire medical industry basically happened within 10 or 20 years. In fact, for $160 million, uh, Rockefeller was able to buy the uh, mind of, of anyone who, who would go to school. The compulsory education uh, founded by the General Education Board was a Rockefeller purchase. And right in line with that, within uh, 10 years, uh, he was jumping into the medical industry. Um, he, he did this through a couple ways. He would, he would buy the local legislator. Basically, he was setting up a, uh, a club for local legislators that could have a basically a centralization that, that he could control. And then he was sponsoring and putting money into hospitals as long as someone on his team was allowed to uh, have a say-so over what the treatment techniques were, were being utilized in this hospital. So really you're looking at a all out assault uh, on, on homeopathy and basically any kind of alternative medicine. And what's really weird about this is that it was happening in the exact same time frame where prohibition started. Now from the outside, you might look at prohibition as like, oh, well, that's a wonderful thing. You know, it's good that, that, that we want to keep America dry, uh, so to speak. But if you look at what was happening with the temperance movement there, America was already dry. Alcohol was not a, a big drug back then. But when you institute a policy, a uh, nationwide policy, where from now on, we have a prohibition on all alcohol, you actually end up constricting something. You're, you're putting your, your, your grip around its neck. You're, you're denying it oxygen. Two things grew when prohibition happened, the federal government and the mafia. In fact, we invented the cocktail during that time. And to come back to what I mean by this possession is, is if you look at alcohol as something that would lower the egoic shield, um, the moment prohibition was lifted, you would, you would know what everyone was going to do. Everyone's going to drink now. It, it becomes a way of actually instrumenting a program that wasn't popular before. You say no one's allowed to do that, and then you say, okay, now everyone can. Um, what I'm suggesting here is, is that if there was something that could control this as, as, a, as an industry, it would make sense to find ways to lower our egoic shields to actually shame the ego, to attack it with drugs, with culture, with uh, government laws, with war, with everything you could possibly imagine to lower that egoic shield so that we could be taken over by uh, basically these possessionary thoughts, these thoughts that make us uh, broken. They put us under mind control. Uh, weird, a lot to say there, Jerry, but if you have any comments, please, please let me know. Well, again, you... <laughs> You branched off into like 10 different branches. Uh, you're exactly right with what happened with uh, Rockefeller and the Fletch, I think it was the Fletchner Report. Right. Um, there were, back in the 1930s, there were a number of different therapies coming into being, electrical, uh, naturopathy, uh, a whole host of 
different therapies and, and they were working, including Tesla's violet ray that doctors were carrying around at that time. Uh, the um, Rockefellers were tied into the drug industry and uh, uh, medicine and they saw these other therapies as a threat. So like you said, they went to the legislature and they outlawed these. They went to the uh, ivory tower and said, listen, um, we're not going to support you in, unless you teach pharmaceutically you know, drug-based therapies and that's it. So any institution that was teaching anything else was not allowed to issue a medical license to practice. And any practitioner who had one who referred to any alternative therapy was mocked and run down and threatened their license to, to take. So in one fell swoop, you know, these rich millionaire guys, it was uh, you know, Rockefeller and, and Carnegie, I believe it was, had wiped out every other therapy in, in the educational institutions other than drug therapy. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, the uh, Violet Ray device uh, was banned by the FDA. It, literally anyone who had one or was trying to sell one was sued, um, which is an attack on the electromagnetic healing industry, which I find really fascinating because this is the exact same time when the special relativity was introduced. I'm not going to drag you through this mud, Jerry, but, but special relativity was, was an idea that was very much pushed against and, and, and disproven by a lot of other scientists that believed more in this concept of almost an electric universe way back then, that there was a plasmatic etheric, etheric field. Mm -hmm. And if we were to think about mental technology, if we were to think about uh, algorithms that run through the, through the ethereal world that can connect to our mind, it's almost like you see someone trying to shroud the truth by turning it into a purely materialistic world where everything can only be cured through a pill or through some type of pharmacological fix, which really does mask any, any layman's ability to, we don't even know what's in those drugs. I mean, we're told, but we don't really even fully understand them. So it definitely takes us from going in one direction and completely turns us around. And we've been on that same path ever since. Um, and we have, and they've resisted it. You know, matter of fact, natural paths are being murdered all over the world. Right. Um, and, you know, you've mentioned several times that it appears like these things are almost um, programmed or of a computer type nature. And I have seen a lot of evidence that appears to substantiate that. You know, they they don't seem to be able to break that negative bound. They're they're held there. You know, they although they can tell people where to get drugs and and you know, there, there's another area where they can predict. I mean, they have predict what's happening. But in line with what I was saying about them going crazy when the patient is about to be told that they are parasites okay they react to that very boldly i mean they get very upset and I, I could actually feel that and they try to distract the patient away now one thing that's very strange that i found is that the patient needs to know this you know and once they find that out they start resenting the voices mm -hmm. you know because they don't fully understand that they're parasites so when I got the patient to the place where I thought they could comprehend that, that they knew that the voices weren't who they were, that they understood that every time the voices appeared, they were being drained. You know, I would tell them, I, I would ask them, I said, are you hearing the voices right now? And they would say, no. And so when's the last time you heard them? Well, a few hours ago. And I would tell them, okay, they're going to appear in about five minutes. And this is what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to give you some information. First, they're going to say that I'm crazy, stupid, and a nutcase, and don't listen to anything I say. If you stay, they're going to tell you um, <clears throat> to leave the office, to get out of here, to escape the ER. If you still stay, they're going to tell you to attack me. And what was so friggin' strange is that even though I warned the patient, he had told him what was going to happen, 
those things rolled off just like that in that order. They could not change them. So if, if somebody told you, hey, you're going to dance on your head naked in five minutes, you know, you'd go, eh, screw you, I'm not. You know, if they told you you were going to do anything in five minutes, you'd probably go, see, I'm going to do the opposite just to show you. These things did not seem to be able to change that pattern. Yeah. You know, if, if anybody was telling us we're going to do this, we, we wouldn't do it. But they could not. They would run off just as like that, like clockwork. And that constantly amazed the patient. Like, how'd you know that? Yeah. And then I had their attention. You know, once you get their attention, then you can start talking to them. Now, the medicines, uh, the only reason they work is because they calm the person down. These entities feed off of negative emotional energy, and everything they inject into your mind, every negative thought is, is designed to generate that negative emotional energy. And a lot of patients would say, I could feel them taking it. I could feel it being sucked off. You know, that is their food. That is their energy. That's why they do that. That's why it's all negative. That's why it's horrible. And the only reason those medicines work is because they calm the patient down. They're basically major tranquilizers, which makes it harder for these entities to upset them. Yeah. You know, if you look at, uh, at what communication is, when we have facial contact, you know, most of the brain is lit up in facial recognition. In fact, your brain burns more calories than any other organ. And most of that is trying to facilitate facial recognition. This tells me that there's actually a telepathic connection happening between us when we share. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because if you imagine one person in a very sad mood and another person in a very happy mood, and let's say that person in the happy mood is a, is a child and they smile, that smile is transmitting some kind of energy that is going across the room to the person that's sad and they are going to now feel happier. Now, there's no way in the world that any of our modern materialistic science is ever going to be able to document that. They're not going to be able to say this is what is happening on this level. I think it's because we're ignoring the ether, but, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to keep that out of our discussion because it's not even something that you may even subscribe to. But my point is, is that there is some sort of energy that's being transferred between people. We know that. We can prove it. We just can't measure it in the way that the people in the white coats want us to measure it before they will tell us that it's real. And that really comes back to this mind control where the person with the white robe is almost like a voodoo priest where he's telling you what is reality. And if he doesn't uh, deaconize that reality, uh, we are forced to not believe it, which coming back again to this psychic attack, if you do not believe something, you are realistically having horse blinders on where for the rest of your life, you're not going to be looking at that. Well, that, that's exactly right. These guys come out of medical school and they go, okay, uh, you know, we know what reality is now, and we're going to tell you what it is. And, you know, you look at what happens to these people when they go to a, a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. You know, they're walking along, all of a sudden they start hearing these voices that, you know, they, some of them think everybody hears these voices. They tell their friends and their friends think they're weird, start backing away and, you know, hey, this guy's possessed. They tell their family, their family gets all upset and, and then they start isolating they start getting agitated and irritable and cranky and acting out and uh threatening the family family takes them to a psychiatrist psychiatrist says oh you're hearing voices okay you're crazy uh you're a lunatic uh it can't yeah, be fixed imbalance. Yeah. yeah you're in balance it can't be fixed there's nothing we can do you got a chemical imbalance in your brain you got to take these awful pills for the rest of your life you know and there is no other solution there is no what you're hearing are hallucinations mm -hmm. You know, and that was one of the biggest things for me to get at because at the state hospital, these guys have been drugged so badly for so long. And if they talked about the voices, they would be drugged more. Mm -hmm. So they would be drugged until they shut up. So they stopped talking about these things. And if they even felt that I thought they were hallucinations, which I did for a long time, they would just shut up. Yeah. It was only when I started giving them the benefit of the doubt that they started talking a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I did before I uh, came on is we have a group of schizophrenics uh, that it's like a support group. There's probably 
you know, probably uh, 67 or, or 80 people in there. And I put out a note. I said, what do you want the audience to hear when I do these lectures? What, what do you want them to know? And only one answered. You know, and no, none of the others countermanded what she said. So he, here's what she said. She said, the most important thing for them to know is that the voices are not hallucinations, mm -hmm. but are, in fact, malevolent, demonic entities that audibly terrorize people and feed off the extreme negativity they cause. Mm -hmm. Additionally, the rest of the public is also being affected by them, as in my case, she says, as they can influ influence us by inserting negative thoughts into our minds and pushing destructive desires, habits, and addictions in an effort to destroy our lives. And then they can, again, feed off all the chaos they produce. Hmm. They are parasites feeding off the strife they orchestrate from behind the scenes by negatively influ influencing humanity. Lastly, I have personally found success with... Uh, the version of Sherry's That's a Lie program. Now, you ought to interview Sherry. She's my mm -hmm. cohort. She's my, my right-hand woman. I mean, uh, uh, she's been there. Okay? Yeah. So, so I've only heard these things once, and, and that was a, a real learning experience. But she struggled with them for years. So if you get her on, she can tell you the inside story. Because mm -hmm. I've been, you know, for the most part, looking in and watching. And, and, but she's been there. Yeah, so I, I'll well, give you. Also, a yeah, you've also felt that you've really bared the brunt of of the worst of the worst too, yes. because of you know because of all your experience. Uh, Sherry has a great interview. It'll definitely be linked in here along with Jerry's with Freeman TV. Um, really, just a great expose on that. Um, Sherry Moore goes into uh, how to release these these guys. How how to uh, basically she's plucking them. Uh, from the bush <laughs> and, and sending them on their way, it, which is very similar to, to what the, that guy uh, Wickman uh, was doing with his life. No, Wickman was doing something very different. What Sherry was doing was starving them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So her, that's a lie program. Almost everything they say is a lie, you know, or it's it disguised as a lie. In some cases, if it's, if, uh, they will. They they can do su no supernatural stuff. Like they've told prisoners where to hide, where to go, where the where the loot was in houses, um, uh, where the drugs are. I mean, they they know stuff that the the patient didn't know. Now, what Sherry's program does is actually starves them, because you have to buy into their lies to be upset. Their mm -hmm. lies are designed to upset you. You know, like you're no good, you're rotten, you're stupid, you're never going to make anything of yourself. You, uh, your parents hate you. Uh, your girlfriend is just faking like she uh, likes you. I mean, it's just constant things striking at your vulnerable parts. And if you've been traumatized, they are aware of that. They, they, they can smell trauma like blood. And they'll go in there and they'll start picking at that trauma, saying it was your fault. You did this. So it's, it's constant negative lies. And what Sherry does is she found that virtually everything they said was a lie. And if she countered that and said, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. They couldn't get a grip. They were like fishermen that were just throwing in the bait and seeing if you bite. And if you bite, they hooked you. Mm -hmm. you know? And if they hooked you, they generated the negative emotional energy that they feed off of. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they, they kind of wire buttons, you know, where you say somebody pushes your button, they wire those buttons to where you, they can push it and it upsets the person and, and then they, they feed and they pour gasoline on those traumas. So it's, it's very important that those traumas are brought up and healed. Right. Yeah. If they're not, they can keep, they'll keep hammering at them. Now, I've heard of MK Ultra that, the, you know, they do have that uh, skull to voice technology. But back in my day, n nobody ever heard of that. You know, I'm not even sure they had it back in the 70s. They may have. But they, I, even if they did, I don't see why they would waste it on these, these people who were in the hospital who really posed no significant threat to them. I mean, they weren't like us exposing the, the cabal and, and, and these dark entities. Uh, they, they, you know, they pr really destroyed their lives. Um, well, beyond the MK Ultra, there, there's actually army devices. This really is just standard issue army equipment now 
that can uh, micro beam thoughts into someone's head. Um, this is a little bit different than the demon stuff because these are actual uh, 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 words. They're actually hearing words in their head. And this is through a micro transmitter that's, uh, that's being shot across a field. Um, there's a film out there that's pretty popular. I'll see if I can find a link to that. With it. Well, I've heard they can do that. One of the things that kind of uh, bothers me about bringing these truths out as to what is really going on inside the mind of the schizophrenic is that they could take that information and that they wouldn't normally have and make it mimic what I'm saying these things are saying, mm -hmm. which would make that technology even more dangerous because then it would actually mimic schizophrenia. You know, right. if they could, if if they could see what the voices are saying and how they're saying and how they operate, they could use that against uh, against people. Another difficult thing, because it's it's almost going to be impossible to really isolate it, is is that um, okay? So right now we have something called cymatics. You, you can play a sound, and you're not going to see the pattern, but there's actually a really beautiful pattern that can be formed in different uh, frequencies that are that are played. These patterns um, could could be electromagnetic. Um, I'm not saying that the sound is, but it, it could be very easy that, that there's an electromagnetic uh, field wave that's around us. And if you were to stimulate the brain uh, in the frontal cortex, it's going to get uh, feelings that are much more closer to something that might be joy. Um, if you were to stimulate the inner reptilian core, it might be something more uh, dichotomous, where it's you know fight or flight or or, or shock or, or something more more base root. Um, I say this because it could be that the demons themselves don't actually know language. What they know is 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 cymatic feeling. They're able to stimulate the brain in in the front and the back and the side in just the right way to allow the person to reconstruct. Uh, again, our thoughts are con probably constructed from the chemicals that's happening underneath it. 95% of our, of our thoughts actually are non-algorithmic. It's more about patterns. We're, we're trying to make things fit into a pattern so that we can pal palatably absorb our environment. I'm not saying that that's what demons are, but it's just interesting that it's, it's actually really difficult to assign exactly what traits they have. Um, I basically found four traits or maybe five. Number one is they seem to have some sort of memory. They could be tapping that from their user. Uh, no, no, the, the, the memory they have, it comes from the patient. They, do, they don't seem to have any memory of their own. You know, it, it's all, it all comes from, from, from what I've seen. It all comes somewhere from the patient. Well, what about the instance of the, the patient that uh, his voices were telling him, get in the car, drive to Oregon, I know where you can score some dope. And he, he does that. And he's able to find the field, find the park, find the right guy, get the dope, you know, get his well, fix. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. And there are cases like that. Um, he, they did know that. Uh, ahead of time there were there were several other cases like that where they knew things like which houses to rob when the people were up uh, when the cops were coming um, and and I'm not so sure uh, I, I was thinking maybe that has something to do with vibration but for the most part they weren't able to provide any information other than what the patient already knew for the most part you know right. Um, Van Dusen had one that where the voice claimed he was an engineer, but he didn't know anything more about mathematics or engineering than the patient themselves knew. Fascinating, right? Um, so, so and, and for the most part, that's what happens. These these other ones are like an anomaly. I mean, they, gotcha. they they didn't occur that often, but when they did, they were really gripping. They were very tension getting because of how strange they actually were. So almost like a, a more advanced piece of software right where yeah I, I think your your analogy to computers is is on the I, I think if you look at the brain like the hardware okay that's the hardware the software are the thoughts that kind of come in there now the question has to be asked is where does that software come from right yeah, where's the command prompt? And right. where did the where does the information come from? Where, you know, and if you stand back and you watch those thoughts flow into your head, you know they're not coming from you. Mm -hmm. They're coming from somewhere else. You're the watcher. You're the one who's witnessing this, and and you've been programmed since the day you were born 
you know, to, be, to believe your version of reality. This is, this is what it is. And anything that upsets that is going to be, I actually did an experiment with this once, you know, by creating a very bizarre situation and watching what these people did. And this was back when I was reading Cast Not. And one of the things Cast Not said is if you encounter something so bizarre that it doesn't fit your mindset, if it doesn't fit your reality, your mind is going to blot it out, change it, or forget it. Mm -hmm. So I created a bizarre situation with a group of people and that I was able to step away from because I had a Confederate kind of trigger it. And then I watched what happened. You know, it, it slowly morphed. It morphed from the actual situation to that was totally incomprehensible and made no sense to one that made more sense and then one that made a little more sense but still didn't make sense. And then eventually they've completely blotted it out yeah so i'm going when i see these weird things at the state hospital i know my mind is doing the same thing yes you know yeah. and and i was watching for that so every time something very strange happened like some of these stories i've had i, I would jot them down because i knew if i didn't i would forget them and that's exactly yeah. what happened you know so now i'm open to these these things i, I mean it's like i i realized that you know, my story is just a story and it mm -hmm. just keeps repeating itself. But my, my version of reality, my particular personal reality has been blown apart so many times yeah. <laughs> that I no longer, uh, you know, I, I, I know there's things going on here beyond my comprehension. And with that mindset, I can start, I can see those things. I can see them start happening. So, so let me, let me correct what I said then. Um, and tell me, tell me if this is, if this is closer to, to your thinking here, uh, for the most part, uh, demons do not have any kind of memory per se. They're, they're basically jacking off the, uh, you know, the possessor's brain. They're, they're utilizing that technology. They're not. Right. And they're using their memory against them. Gotcha. So they'll go in there and they'll pull up every rotten thing they've ever done and rub it in their face. Mm -hmm. They'll tell them all kinds of rotten things about them. You know, one of the, one of the classic marks, earmarks of them is they're constantly saying negative things about the person himself and others around them. Mm -hmm. And virtually all of that are lies. Yeah, you know, and that's they how want you would you to hook it. into. Yeah, and that's how you would blanket uh, depression or anger or you know uh, distaste. It's, it's right. forcing you to focus. Uh, where if you're going out for a walk, all you're going to see is dog poop. But like that's a great example right. of that on you the know. negative. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a filter for the negative. It's it's actually maybe even rewarding the brain in some way for finding things that are negative and trying to create a pattern where, where you kind of fall into that. Yeah, they call it negative gravity. You know, once you once you get there, you st it starts yeah. drawing in more negativity. You know? And I want to say and, on and negative gravity that 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 sorry to interrupt you, but but that directly directly ties in line with what's happening with our media right now. Mm -hmm what's happening with how we're being reported on all of these things are, are stimulating the exact same thing, but on a mass scale. Yeah. You look at the news, it's negative, 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 cur murder, killing, you it's know, uh, and ask who controls this stuff, you yeah. know, who controls this stuff by the time a kid gets to be teenage years, he's, he's seen like what 30,000 murders on television. Yeah. And then they wonder why, you know, the kids are violent and, and then you got these violent video games where they're killing people yeah and they say oh i saw it the other day on television cnn said oh there's no link between violent movies and and actual violence that's crap mm -hmm. it's total bull crap and, well, and they're protecting that and they're they're transmitting this negativity and this fear constantly and and people are buying it and they're you know they're generating this negative emotional energy that these entities feed off of. in every single movie that you see anything that involves hollywood and demons is always a terrifying uh ordeal it's yes. putting you into that shock state where again your your egoic barrier your shields are down and it's going to be that much easier you know from my age with poltergeist with exorcist these are like some real life uh, mental programming, priming to allow for things like this to happen. Um, back to the, the demon thing with the first, the first, cause I, I would love it if our readers could actually have some characteristics of all these. So we know that, that they, they function off the, the memories of the person, of their host, 
Uh, secondly, would you agree that, that they don't actually show any kind of signs of aging or more importantly, a temporal timeline? Um, it's going to be really hard to answer, Jerry, because as long, you know, they're going to know what you're thinking. So, you know, as you progress, it might look like the demon is, but it's from what I'm reading, they don't actually have like their own personal history that they can build from. No, no, they, uh, they don't. They don't have a, a personal history. Uh, they don't appear to age. They, uh, they don't seem to be um, affected by time and space. Exactly. You know, I think that's really important. Um, it, it, as because after I get these characteristics out, I want us to talk more about this software thing, you know, and just, just see where, where that takes us. Um, I'll move on to the next point, but I might've interrupted you. Did you have anything more to say about age? Well, um, one thing that did pop to mind is that uh, with regard to time and space, the voices that I studied at, while I was working at Central State Hospital, we're saying the same exact kind of things that 2,500 miles away in the prison that the, the criminally insane schizophrenics there were hearing. It was the same stuff. Wow. You know, that, so so it's, it's almost like they were all programmed out of the same cookie cutter to do the same kinds of things mm -hmm. and they're negative and they're designed to destroy and dismantle the individual. And they do that like uh, in a manner very similar to what armies do to captured prisoners. You know, they hammer at them constantly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they keep them awake. They deprive them of food. They, they isolate them. And isolation is one of the big things. One of the first things they go after is family and friends. Anybody who cares for the person, they'll start filling their heads with, well, you can't trust them. They're no good. They really don't care about you. Uh, get away from them. And, and so, so they start driving that wedge in. They start exploding in, at these people and, and driving them away because they, they want no interference from loved ones. They don't want anybody convincing that person that they're not real, that um, uh, trying to drag them back into their previous reality. Uh, they want them totally isolated so they can hammer at them and that isolation only makes them worse. So it's very critical that the families of these people keep up the support. You know, and and they make that very hard because uh, they're they're constantly telling the 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 patient bad things about the family. Their girlfriends are cheating on them, and their wives are cheating on them. They can't trust anybody. That they're 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 breaking them away. They're isolating them. They're gaslighting them, just like a malignant narcissist or a psychopath would do. Which makes you wonder if maybe these kind of uh, or. Uh, people that we see are actually, you know, a living possession uh, themselves that's causing this kind of behavior because it's always the exact same behavior that you see. In fact, the government's doing that too. The government gaslights us every day. They just did with Epstein. This is a continued effort to uh, basically pull the rug out from underneath you so you don't really know where you stand, which is how you lower the egoic shields and, you know, you can make your, your invasion uh, that much more effective. Yeah, uh, you look at the uh, CNN. I mean, the people who listen to CNN, uh, um, completely gone. I mean, they don't yeah. realize they're constantly being lied to. I mean, yeah, all know. the mainstream media. I mean, they just they they take that as fact. They can't comprehend the the kind of things that are actually taking place. You know, it, it, they they don't want to see it. It's outside. You know, it's shock. You know, you would you could argue that that what we call an NPC now, those you know, we have drawings of them as like gray people, but what we call an NPC is really nothing more than a human that's in shock, that they've been induced into shock for so long that they they just go along with whatever. This is this is classic trauma programming. This is classic Stockholm syndrome, but it's happening on a nationwide scale. Well, on and, a worldwide scale. Well, yeah, that too. But if you look at JFK, JFK is the perfect. Uh, trauma programming exercise. It's how you would induce uh, the, the same way the army would do that to, you know, a, a foreign prisoner. Right. You're, same you're, way with 9-11, same thing. You exactly. know, the, the mass shocking of of the populace. With no answer following. That, that's that that's would, crucial. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then they sweep up all the evidence and, and take it to China. And, and now they're coming out, uh, a society of engineers and architects are, are suing uh, New York saying, listen, that, you know, there's incontroversial evidence of explosives being yeah. used here. 
Yeah. yeah. And, even and they're, that, they're, being, they're being blown off. And even if that comes out, I guarantee you it's going to be unrolled in a certain way where it's going to be used to take over another country instead of actually looking at ourselves and going, hey, we, we, we did this. This is pretty crazy. But we're getting off track. Um, th those are the first two. Uh, just to repeat, uh, the memory is being harvested from the host. Uh, they don't appear to have any kind of temporal existence where they don't actually age or progress. You know, you're not seeing a mood swing where they're having a good day and a bad day. I'm talking about the demon, not the host. Mm -hmm. Thirdly is this idea of plurality, which is fascinating. This is not one voice. This is the voices. And there's always a hierarchical chain of command inside uh, the demon's framework. How the demon is functioning is a very systematic uh, system that's been in place by them. He's been given a task. He's been uh, threatened if he doesn't follow this task. Uh, he's bringing back a body uh, as a sort of reward system that keeps him um, out of punishment. Um, so this plurality thing is really interesting. This is not one. These are multiple voices. And, and as you just touched on, they're not even individually different. They're not even unique. This is very much of a cookie cutter, uh, industrialized thing that's coming out. Well, to some degree, they are unique. They're male and female voices. You know, they do have their own kind of personalities, and they're always negative. Um, and <clears throat> let me see, what did you say about... Uh, well, did they have names? Like, like, uh, yeah, they, they, you have to ask them their names. Uh, they do have names. And uh, one of them, I remember one patient asked their names and they said they were legion. Now there are times where there are hundreds of them screaming at the patient, you know, and those guys get really upset. I mean, that's really hard to have hundreds of them screaming in your head at the same time. Now, Emanuel Swedenborg said that they are not just singular voices, but they are groups of voices speaking as one, which I found fascinating because until I read that, they were, uh, you know, I experienced them, the patient would say they are, this is this voice, and this one's this voice, and, and, and this one says this, and this one said that, and, um, you know, they, they, they are recognized in a lot of times as individual entities that are attacking the person. But most of the time, it's a it's a plural attack. Would you say? Uh, some uh, sometimes it is. Uh, most of the time, it's one or two or three or four um, that are are there. Now, as far as the hierarchy, it, there was a period of time where I would actually bring the the patient in and and actually speak to the voices. Mm -hmm. And uh, one voice told me that yeah, they were assigned that they do have another level over them and that if they don't do a good job they're taken there and, and thrown into the pit whatever the pit is you know but they are punished they're punished if they are found if they're found out you know so when when i started speaking to them they were found out you know, and so by recognizing a, a a demon inside of somebody that demon has failed right he, he he has failed uh, and that can be used against them. Now, what I also found out was that they were told by their higher ups that they didn't have any light within them. Yes. That if they didn't do what they were told, they would cease to exist. Mm -hmm. And what I would do at that time when I was experimenting with this, I'd say, well, let's go see. Let's go look within you and see. And I would imagine like traveling down into the darkness and I'd ask them, ask the voice, do you, do you see any light yet? And well, no. Well, how about now? No. Well, now. Yeah, yeah, I, okay, I see a dim orange light. And I'd say, well, your, the, your, your boss has told you you didn't have any light. Wasn't that true? And they went, yeah, and they got angry. Yeah. They've got furious. And that surprised me, that they would get furious at that. Yeah, they well, went, anger is a healthy reaction to injustice, which kind of shows you more about their their own yeah, nature you, a little bit more. Yeah, but you talk about injustice. There was nobody as unjust as these things were, mm -hmm. you know, and and it just surprised me that once they saw that that they had light in them, that they would tear into their, you know, their uppers. It would cause a huge disruption there. Now, what I also found out was that. Um, 
they were told that the light would burn them, that it was bad. Mm. And um, wow. what, I would, what I did for a period of time is uh, I would ask them to stick their hand in the light and they said, no, it'll, it'll burn me. I said, no, it won't. Stick your hand in there. And they did and nothing happened. And I would say, okay, walk into the light. And they would do so hesitantly. And then I'd say, uh, who do you know who is deceased that, that you trust? Mm. And they would name something. Sometimes it was animals. That was strange. And an aunt or a grandma or a mother or father would appear. And I'd ask, do you trust them? And they would say, yeah. And I said, well, listen, you've been found out. You know what's going to happen if you go back to the way you are. You, I've, you know, you've spoken to me. I know what you are. I know who you are. You're going to be punished. You're going to be thrown in the pit for this. You know, do you trust these people? And they go, yeah. And I said, well, then stick your hand out there and go with them. And if they left, that voice was gone. You know? And sometimes I had higher voices you know, in the echelon, maybe the next level up that I'd do that with, and they would not enter the light. They would not do it. Hmm. They would not go there. Um, but if they did, and Wickland, uh, I think it was Wickland was doing basically the same thing. He would administer static electric shocks to drive these things out into his psychic wife, and then she would talk them into the light, hmm. and then they would be gone, which makes me wonder what would happen uh, if the Tesla – uh, ray was used the uh, static electric shock from the tesla ray because one of the things i started out doing after i read wickland was a, a kind of thinking what can i do in the prison that would administer something similar to a shock that i wouldn't get fired for mm -hmm. and i thought about that for months until i saw a rubber band sitting on the uh, secretary's desk and i went maybe that would do it and I was in touch with Van Dusen at that time. He was a clinical psychologist who had retired from a psych hospital in uh, California. And he was speaking to the voices all the time, much more than I did. You know, he would give them tests. Uh, he would question them. He was trying to make friends with them, thinking he would learn a lot more if, if he made friends with them. It was the opposite. You know, you learn a lot more by trying to destroy them because then you see what they're really capable of. Right. But, but taking one of the things uh, that I found was I would hand out the 23rd Psalm. One, one patient, one prisoner told me that when he repeated the 23rd Psalm, it was akin to uh, poking the voices with a hot stick. They hated it. And that was unique information to me. And I went, okay, well, anything that works, I'll try. Mm -hmm. So I started handing out the 23rd Psalm, and it was upsetting the voices. I got a lot of feedback from, from psychotic prisoners saying they don't like it. They really don't like it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but then they would, uh, the voices would get them to lose it or forget to right. repeat it or distract them. Mm -hmm. So I handed out that rubber band, said, put it on your wrist, and every time you start hearing the voices, snap that rubber band and tell me what happened. They would come back and they would say, yeah, that shut them up. It shut them up for up to a minute, enough time to remember to repeat the 23rd Psalm. Mm -hmm. you know? So when the chief psychologist found out that I was handing out the 23rd Psalm, uh, I was ordered to stop that. When he found that I was handing out rubber bands for them to snap, I was ordered to stop that. Of course. So, so everything we were finding that worked, I was being ordered to stop. You know? And in the state hospital, I was ordered by the psychiatrist to stop asking patients about their hallucinations because I was only making them worse, that I was reinforcing their voices and yeah. they were getting worse because of that. And that happened more than once. Yeah. So I had to be very careful at the state hospital because one of the underlying rules was you don't upset psychotic prisoners. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, inmates, really, you don't know what they're going to do when they get upset. So, yeah. well, and between treating and managing and, you know, and these guys, well, are that's what they were doing at the, uh, at, that's what they're doing now. They're only managing yeah. these things. They're not, they're not, they have no cure. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't believe in the voices until they they realize that these voices are, are not hallucinations, that these things actually exist. They run consistent, persistent, repeatable patterns that they're never going to find the cure for paranoid schizophrenia, mm -hmm. which is the, it's on one of the top 10 maladies of, of the planet. Yeah. You know? And all they're doing is drugging it and making a fortune while they're doing it. And uh, anybody, there was a, a Professor Kermal Ermark, uh, watched a shaman in, uh, he's in Pakistan, I think it is. 
and he published a journal article saying, hey, I've watched this shaman cure schizophrenics. You know, the medical establishment might want to look into this. Yeah. And man, he was attacked every way up and down by all these these uh, academics, by by doctors. Uh, they attacked the journal. They attacked the journal publisher, uh, saying you're bringing us back to the Stone Age. I mean, they were just cruel with with what he did. And and there was one one professor who was a professor of philosophy or something in one of the big universities in England, like Oxford or something like that. When I read her comments, <laughs> I wrote her back and I said, you don't know your ass from a hole in the ground. You've never spoken to a schizophrenic. You've never been around one. You'd have no idea what's going on. You know, I can tell by what you wrote that you, you know, this is a bunch of horse crap, you know, and I just, I just blasted her. I said, uh, here I am, you know? Yeah. Well, the, the term quack, was actually developed during that Rockefeller time when yeah, he yeah, it was alternative yeah. medicine. And that's, right. that's how you shame. This is why you, they say things like toxic masculinity. This is why they say things like white supremacy. All of these are meant to uh, shame or curtail uh, a solution into in between two towers. And those two towers yeah. are, are the industry uh, that we see now. So all, yeah, to, to divide people, to keep them separated, to, to uh, keep them at each other's throats constantly. I mean, yeah. Um, I, I want to go back and, and ask if you have anything else to say about this real specific idea you mentioned about that these demons, they would get so angry when they found out the truth about light that they would, that they would go back to maybe even attack their higher ups. Um, do you have any more information about that at all, about, about their higher ups, about just anything you can say about this uh, chain of command structure? Not, not a lot. I know it exists. Um, I remember one patient where, we got rid of um, two voices, okay? So we walked them in the light, they, they were gone. And then all of a sudden I felt that icky electrical feeling. Mm -hmm. And I said, who's, who's that one? Who, where'd that one come from? And uh, they said, well, that's their boss and he's pissed off. You know, so, so the boss entered the host, the, the, the victim's body along with, with the subordinate demons. Yeah. Well, the subordinate demons were gone, but this one came in. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And then I could feel it. I mean, I could feel that icky electrical feeling and it was pissed off. Wow. You know, um, it never communicated with me, but I knew it was angry. Um, uh, did, did the patient, so the, did the patient's demeanor also change in, in addition to you feeling an electromagnetic difference? I assume you saw No, other than saying uh, it's a different one. You know, this, this one's their boss. Uh, gotcha. and, and he kind of seemed surprised because he hadn't experienced that one before either. Um, so the, there does appear to be a hierarchy. Uh, and I heard one account where the patient, it was a female and it was a male voice. And that one wasn't doing as much damage as it, as it was supposed to be. Uh -huh. And it was relieved. It was taken away and replaced by another one that was nastier. And was it, was it told you're being relieved? Yeah, it was taken away, yeah. Wow. That's, that was the only case I've heard like that, though. That, that, that was, you know, that was it. If, if they fail in, in causing sufficient destruction to the person, uh, they're relieved and, and taken to whatever this pit is that they, they really didn't like that place, Yeah, whatever it was. Great, great segue, because that, that was my next uh, thing. Before I go on, though, I'll just say it's, Whenever you, you can distinguish the shape of the predator in the trees, like from the movie, when you, when you get an idea of what its shape is like, you really have won the battle right there because you, you know exactly who the enemy is. And it sounds like this is exactly what's happening here. Yeah, they don't want you to know that they are, they want you to think that those thoughts are your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That, 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 that this is your mind and that it, it is out of control and, um, you're starting to lose your sanity and that generates a massive amount of anxiety and fear. And that's what they feed off of. Just you know, like they, they don't want you to know that the false flag shootings are caused by crazy people that shouldn't be trust, trusted with guns instead of by maybe some covert program that's trying to install fear on purpose. So you'll enter into this same shock state. It's the exact same framework. I'm not saying that they're related, but they certainly could be because they're using the same plays. Mm-hmm. Now, back to this pit thing, 
because I found that fascinating. I, I was a software engineer long before I was a writer. In fact, when I left that wilderness camp, I, I went into the business of the internet and publishing and self-taught software programmer, d done some AI work, even worked with uh, some autistic kids by developing them an interface. Um, I, this idea of a pit reminds me of the Linux shell. The Linux shell is I can open up my computer and I have a black window with a, a dancing cursor. And out of that cursor, I can invoke, this is so weird, but I can invoke uh, a demon. It's called D-A-E-M-O-N. It's a, a ghost of something that looks like me. Uh, what I mean by that is, is that I can assign it tasks. I can say, hey, demon, I want you to open a browser program and go to ebay.com and do a search for uh, Big Wheel and find me every auction that's being sold where someone's selling a classic 1977 Big Wheel for sale because I want to stock that auction. So I can create an army. It's never one. I create a crone. I call on crone to create these demons. She creates an army of them. They all have the exact same task. And it never really matters to me, the programmer, if that demon lives or dies. All I really care about is what they're going to bring back to the system. And when we talk about everything that you've described, sounds exactly like that. And then when you say the pit, it makes me think about what actually happens to an algorithm. When I invoke a spider to do these things, it, it's coming out of a pit where nothing was existing before. <laughs> it's running through a program and doing the best it can. And if it fails that program, it will be destroyed. It will return to the pit. It, can you give us any more details about the pit? Like I, I would just, I would just love to download everything you've you've heard about this about this pit. Well, I, you know, I, I, all I know is that it exists because they've mentioned it so many times. Now, Sherry, who you ought to interview after me, uh, who's experienced these things, she has the same um, basic idea you do. And I agree with that these things are, are somewhat robotic. You know, they say the same things over and over and over again. And, and you know, they'll switch to a different track. So she was telling me one time where they were telling her all this rotten stuff about herself. And she's going, I know that's all lies. You know, get out of my face. Uh, leave. And they, they actually said, well, then what about this? And they took a different track and then started telling her other rotten stuff about herself. So it's, it's almost like, okay, if that program didn't work, we're going to run this one. So she also feels they are of a robotic nature and, and maybe controlled by something beyond them. Right. Any uh, descriptions of the pit that you can recall? Is any given anything like that? No. No, it, it, all I all I would say is it existed, and it wasn't a good place. Dark you know, or light or fire? I'm sorry, I know you're saying no, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna ask anyway. I, I assumed it was dark, but uh, you know they'd never said that. Gotcha. You know, Up or down, all, like above or below or to the side. Well, again, this is this is an assumption. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they never said anything other than you know. If I fail, this is where I'm going to go. I assumed it was down, but they never said that. They right. never gave a, a, a great amount of information about it, and I, I've never asked about it. I don't know why. I mean, it, now that I think about it, I'm going, why didn't I ask them about that? Why, <laughs> you know, it's like now I don't have access to a clinical population, and I can't ask them. You know, so. Yeah. Well, it, it's, uh, it, it's fascinating, that, but you definitely agree that multiple demons tell you there's a pit. This is definitely something that's a shared commonality with all of them, that they all fear this pit, and it's definitely a place that they don't want to go. Well, I, I wouldn't say all. I've, I've only heard this from a handful of them, okay. but they were all, all saying the, the same thing. Um, now, it, it, in the face of all this kind of programmed stuff, remember you brought up before that they knew things that didn't match that program. So what I did is I got the account of one uh, schizophrenic gal that wrote me and, you know, <clears throat> after she saw one of my videos and said, this is what I'm experiencing. Have you experienced anything similar? Now, this is what she, this is what she writes. She said, sorry, uh, this is pretty, this is a pretty weird message and I can't make any sense of this uh, myself. 
uh, one year ago, I started hearing a voice in my head. Uh, he could talk to me, make me feel like he was poking me with needles or cutting me with a knife. Food started tasting like shit and water like piss. He could totally control everything I could imagine. So it seemed like a black magic trick. But then things started to go more weird. He told me that he's been harassing me my whole life. Uh, and I started to realize that I had in, in my past really weird moments. Like at one point in my life, I had every day uh, a headache that always ended at 12 o'clock. I had a lot of itching, which didn't make sense. I'd done many embarrassing things that I hated and so on. My every device and my friend and the voice, uh, voice family devices had some sort of virus uh, which shouldn't exist. Uh, I'm not clear on exactly what she's saying there. The voice told me that it would be nice if my mom would make some pancakes. In no time, my mom called me and asked if I wanted to come eat some pancakes. The next day, she said to me, we should go get some candy. I needed to take one lady to the pharmacy, so I said uh, uh, to him that we're not going to stop. Well, this lady wanted to go into the candy shop, too, and indeed, we bought those candies. There were, uh, there were free fidget spinners in the shop, and I put one in my bag. Af uh, after, uh, at the end of the day, it was all in pieces. The voice said uh, to me that this guy is going to say such and such, and the guy indeed did say such and such. Uh, I did something very uh, embarrassing in front of my mom. The next day, my mom didn't even remember that some, something like that had happened. So I have read a lot about black magic, and many people uh, have had those weird moments where two persons saw the same weird thing. Like there was a couple, uh, and one had problems that modern science would label as mental illness, and one point, and one point, all their flashbulbs shattered at the same time. I don't know what she's, that means there. Uh, there was a woman whose stomach was very swollen for reasons, and there were many witnesses. So black magic, uh, so can black magic cause all these issues? Uh, I understand that you could, like, torture someone with it, but how he can predict what someone is going to say or what's going to happen, I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense, like he's God or something. Maybe I'm dealing with uh, a demon. I don't know. And she asked, have you ever heard anything similar? And I told her about the, uh, the, the one prisoner where the uh, voices told him where there were marijuana fields several hundred miles away. And he went up there and he found them. Uh, there were others that uh, uh, told uh, prisoners which houses to rob and where the loot was and where to go hide and where to get more meth when, um, when they ran out. Now, in the long run, all these things were destructive to them, but, you know, it, this kind of place of the, you know, there's this, oh, this big body of evidence that they're kind of like programmed entities, this kind of flies in the face of that, uh, and I don't know what to make of it, I really don't, you know, but they do know things that the, the patient himself did not know. Now, um although this is speculation but if two demons could share data between themselves some of those cases that you described could be explained in other words it doesn't require a malevolent future time reader demon instead it requires that two different demons are sharing data from their host so that the one that, that is making cookies um, is communicating to the the one that's in the daughter uh, saying, hey, why don't you go go have some cookies right now? That there could be some um, kind of etheric information exchange there. Any thoughts on well, that? Well, there, there seems to be some kind of information exchange. But what, what I've found, and I was curious about this, is that the, these voices in one patient's head do not communicate with the voices in another person's head. You know, now they'll, they'll communicate with each other. So if there's like five of them in there, they'll talk to one another and say, well, hey, she's doing this now and she's doing that now and look what she's doing here now and oh, she's stupid or maybe we ought to murder her. You know, they'll talk to one another and kind of plot like they're, they're plotting to, and, the, and the patient can hear them plotting to kill her. 
you know, well, we're going to, we're going to hang you or we're going to have you step in front of a car, or, you know, and here's these plots going on that the patient is actually listening to. But there was no communication between the voices in one person's head and one uh, and another. One interesting case that I need to work up is, is one where there were, you know, two schizophrenic people. One was a, a girlfriend and, a, and a, a boyfriend, and they were both hearing voices. Uh, and and the interaction between them. I know I have notes on that somewhere. Um, I, I need to work that up. Now I did work up a case where um, you know it, it's several pages long. If you want, I could read it. Where the voices virtually took over this person. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it would actually be bringing the audience into like working with what it was like to work with one of these guys. Uh, It'd probably take a while to get through, though. I'm probably 10 minutes or so. I don't know if you want to do that or not. Well, um, it, I'm going to let you make the call on that because I don't know what it is. But, but it does sound like you mentioned the, the couple, the boy and the girl. Um, they had a relationship and that there was some sort of maybe some quasi-communication happening between there. And that no, the, the, their voices weren't, weren't in communication with each other. So the voices in one person's head weren't talking to the voices in the other person's not head. talking, but, but it sounds like you've given a few examples where one voice inside of someone's head is actually able to access information that is inside of another voice's head. And that's why we're seeing these like predictive things where it's like your mom's going to call you and ask you if you want this or we're going to go get some candy. Yeah, I remember one, uh, one page, this was the same guy with the marijuana fields where the voices warned him uh, when he was out on the prison yard. They told him, that guy over there is going to assault you. you know? And he, he paid attention to that. And then it was a day or two later, he was in the bathroom and he'd just taken a shower and his head was soaking wet and he had his comb and he was brushing his hair back and whipping water back out of his hair. That same guy walked into that bathroom and as he did that, he's hit him in the face with the water and yeah. the guy did assault him. So there, you know, it, I think at some level, you know, they are able to at times communicate with probably certain vulnerable people, mm -hmm. you know, or people who are on their same frequency to get them to, to interact like that. Now, if they can convince the person that, they know this kind of stuff, you know, that's pretty powerful, Yeah. you know, and, and lots of times they'll say, well, we can make that beneficial to you too. We can tell you where the drugs are. We can tell you, uh, matter of fact, I remember one, this was a real interesting one where this, this guy was a prisoner and he went into the strip joint and uh, the voices were telling him um, which girls that he could have sex with, mm. you know, in, in this bar. And he took one home, and apparently she liked to have, to be, uh, you know, he, he, the voices picked her out. And apparently she liked to be suffocated while they were having sex. And he strangled her to the point where she was unconscious. You know, and the voices were telling him, you know, to do that. And it shocked him that she, she was, you know, kind of laying there lifeless. He didn't kill her, but she was unconscious. Yeah. And uh, I remember him telling me how shocked he was when uh, that happened. But the voice would actually pick out which women for him to approach. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, there's so much about this is, is also trauma-induced. Uh, the story of Frank James, who was riding on a motorcycle. Um, I, I'm, forgive me, this is either from you or from Wicklin. I can't remember. But this guy was driving a motorcycle, uh, had an accident. Uh, a demon entered him. It uh, was stayed with him for years and years. And then later on, he suffered a head injury. <laughs> and the demon apparently left. That, you know, he, he was very super violent for all these years during that time. And then after it's over, he left again. Uh, plus, let's add that to all these stories where we hear or, or a lot of the documentation where someone's put under anesthesia and they're actually waking up now with, with uh, some kind of entity inside of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard of that too. Yeah. Now, now, one thing interesting with regard to that shock stuff, when at the period of time when they were giving these electroshock treatments at the state hospital, you know, they were using those not to cure anybody, but more as a control because you know, once you run 
you know, 450 volts of electricity through somebody's head, they stay stunned for a good while afterward. And they were using it to keep control. The, the most violent patients were being given those shock treatments. And I watched mm -hmm. one once and it was horrific. Um, but what I did notice is that the voices disappeared for a short period of time after being hit with that much electricity. Mm -hmm. They would vanish for, you know, up to a, a day or, or a few days before they came back. So it makes me wonder, you know, Wickland was using static electricity. It makes me wonder what effect the uh, Tesla's violet ray, the static electricity from that would have on these entities. Uh, whether it would drive them out, whether um, I, re I think Wickland said one of his patients said it was like the voices were experiencing a lightning storm, a painful lightning storm, and 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 they would leave. And the rubber band, when when the inmates I was working with snapped the rubber band, it stunned these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the patient told me it hurts them a lot more than it hurts me. Yeah. And some of them would come back with uh, their their wrists swollen. They hit that rubber band so many times they um, you know but virtually everything that the administration uh, and uh, more that the chief psychologist when he saw that I was trying to do something to interfere with these voices uh, he would stop me cold and and at the end he ended up I ended up uh, when the when schizophrenics started recovering fully recovering going off their meds they went this isn't supposed to happen and uh, they put me under investigation and uh, had another psychologist go in there and ask these patients, well, what's he doing for you in there? What, what are you doing in there? Because I'd spend hours with these guys where, you know, other people working in psych could only stand them for 15 or 20 minutes and then wanted to get rid of them. Uh, and I, I found them fascinating. And uh, he asked this one and the, and the one guy, you know, who recovered and the, and the guy said, well, he's helping us not like you assholes. You know, and boy, that was like pouring gasoline on the fire. But shortly thereafter, I ended up in front of the medical director and, uh, in an, with an inquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, I was being charged with experimenting with prisoners without departmental uh, permission, which I would have never got. Yeah, I, I thought, hey, well, they're going to be happy that these guys no longer need these expensive medications. They're going to be happy about this. No, it was just the opposite. It was yeah. just the friggin' opposite. I couldn't friggin' believe it, you know. Well, one of the reasons why I only lasted a year in that wilderness camp uh, that I, I worked in this wilderness camp for a year. The only reason why I lasted, I, I was fired after a year because I wasn't following the protocol. I, I was, I was instead going, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Let, let, let's deal with this directly. And, and again, when I could see that face switch, uh, when I could see that happen, I, I, I in fact, I would look for opportunities where, oh, wait, he's, he's back. Like one kid I would call Squirrel, I would see him switch. And I would know, okay, there he is. And I would look at that as a therapeutic moment. I wouldn't look at that as, okay, let's call in the, the big pills or, or let's, you know, let's put him in a PMAB, which is a physical management of aggressive behavior. It's, it's all these different things that are uh, not really helping the situation. They're managing. They're not sure. treating. Right. And that's what the medications are right now. They just, they, they dampen down the symptoms and that's all they do. Yeah. Well, they were really in some rare right cases, if they catch it early enough and they hit them with these meds, the thing can't, it can't grab, it can't get hold, mm -hmm. you know, but in most cases, all it's, all it's doing is just uh, destroying their peripheral nervous system, killing brain cells, uh, turning them into semi zombies, which they hate. And that's one of the first things the voices go after is those meds, mm -hmm. you know, they, and, and I wondered why for years, why they continued to go off their medications in the state hospital and chose to go psychotic. Right. I'm like, why, why are they choosing to go crazy instead of staying on their meds? And I would ask all the staff and the staff would say, well, that's just a symptom of their illness. And I'm like, well, what kind of answer is that? Yeah. Or, uh, you know, they're, they're crazy or they don't like the side effects. So I started looking into the side effects. They're not good. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're awful, but they're, they're not anywhere near as bad as a florid psychosis, mm -hmm. which is hell on earth. And I would start asking for years. I mean, that this went on for probably two or three years. Every time one of my patients went off their meds, I would ask them, why did you do that? Why did you go off your meds? Especially those who had done it before. Mm -hmm. And they knew what would happen. I said, you know what happens. Why did you do this? Um, 
well, I, I didn't like the side effects. So I came up with two listings. One of, I said, write down on this piece of paper all the side effects you actually experience with those meds because they don't all experience the same side effects. I got another one and I made a listing of all the uh, symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, like two pages worth, and they were awful. You know, so I took that one sheet with the, you know, the, the side effects, and then I gave them the sheet with all the, the symptoms of schizophrenia. I said, okay, check the ones that you have experienced. You know, and they checked a whole bunch of them. And then I handed them both back, and I said, which worse? Which is worse? Consistently, they would say, well, the, okay, the psychotic, is, the psychotic symptoms are worse. Mm -hmm. And then I'd ask them, well, then why do you keep going off your medications? And you know what they said? I don't know. Yeah. Scores of them, <clears throat> scores of them over and over and over again. This went on for years and I felt like a broken record. Like, I'm like, if they don't know who does. Mm -hmm. And I just kept asking that question. Oh, this went on for two or three years before one girl uh, who had gone off her meds, who was about ready to be thrown out of the rehab program. Uh, now we were trying to find these guys jobs, so they had the function. We were we were teaching them vocational skills, and then trying to place them in jobs to get them out of the hospital. So it wasn't just managing them; they had the function in order to hold down those jobs. So it wasn't just you know give them pills and let them go. I mean, they had the function. I had to find out why they weren't. So th this one gal was about to be thrown out because she'd gone off her meds for the third time, and her mother called me from South Georgia and said don't discharge her. Please don't. I can't handle her down here. I'd like to come up and talk to you. Let's talk to her together and, and, and see what we can do. And I said, well, okay. So I scheduled her for one Friday afternoon. She came up from South Georgia and uh, we were both asking this little gal, why did you do this? Why did you go off at the third time? She said something to the effect of like, you, you won't believe it. And, and I said, well, I've, I've heard a lot of strange things when I'm here. Go ahead and try me. And she said, the voices told me, they were poison, mm -hmm. you know, that they were, that, that the psychiatrist was trying to poison me and then click, you know, a, a lot of things made sense. The assaults on psychiatry in the state hospital were mm -hmm. five to 10 times higher than they were on uh, any other staff. They were equivalent to attendant staff that were around these people 24 hours a day. And psychiatrists only spent 15 or 20 minutes a month with them. And I'm yeah. kind of going, what is a psychiatrist doing to piss these guys off in 20 minutes that are causing them to be assaulted at this mm -hmm. incredible rate? Yeah. It was wow. the medications that they were dishing out that the voices didn't like and knew they came from psychiatry. And they would attack this, they would tell the patient to attack the psychiatrist. Yeah, the truth movement calls that being over the target. Uh, you know, those who are attacked the most are the ones that, that are the most threatening uh, yes. to the paradigm that's over them. One thing that everyone agrees, whether you're an NPC that's kind of locked in the system um, or, or you're, you're someone that, that's looking into, into demonology in, in etherics, is that insanity is caused by some sort of nervous system uh, change. And so if we look at ourselves as electromagnetic devices, um, it would it, it would seem to be a, a good smart way to start to unravel what's happening here, and then when you add that to Tesla's violet ray, well, you know what Sherry's looking. At. Go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm, uh, that's why I'm curious about the violet ray and the uh, um, uh, static shocks. But Sherry contacted, and we both spoke to him, some scientist in India who can uh, came up with a device that can measure the energy in a room. Wow, you know, and uh, it's it's like three or four thousand dollars for this device, but that's something that probably could measure the change in energy of the person, mm -hmm. and actually show hard data that their energy level has dropped once these things attack. Right, you know, right. Because the the academic ivory tower is not going to believe anything that they can't see, measure feel, hear, or taste. Yeah. Well, and, and that goes into uh, hydrotherapy because uh, some people, at, at least Carl, Carl Wickland had mentioned that hydrotherapy, uh, a continuous flow of water, um, sometimes helps these things. I'm not suggesting we water more patients. I'm talking about just uh, water therapy in general. Um, and it's interesting because so much of, of water um, has these effects electromagnetically on our body too. You know, it's an ionization uh, uh, type phenomenon that's happening. There's a lot to that. And 
So even if you look back at what we've been trying to do in the past, there's always these similar kind of things that, in, in my opinion, hint that this is an electromagnetic issue. There, there's something that can be corrected uh, by doing that. Even your, your terrifying story of the, of the static charge that was moving through the room uh, really, you know, really kind of hints at that, that this is an electromagnetic phenomenon we're dealing with. Well, they, they did use water therapy at the state hospitals for a good period of time. They found that warm water kind of calmed these guys, you know, but it didn't didn't really cure anything. So then they carried it to the extremes. Right. You know, they, they started with the fire hoses and they would hose them down with fire hoses and then they would uh, pack them and uh, keep them in a tub for sometimes 24 hours in the tub of water, only letting them up to go to the bathroom. And then they would pack them in water with ice water. So and they were trying all kinds of crazy stuff to have some kind of impact on, on these things. Uh, and they did find that, you know, warm bath water did calm them down. And I've heard from some spiritual sources that they usually attach in the back of the neck. And if you run warm water there, it, it they don't like it or they, it kind of loosens them, but it's not enough to really drive them away. They, it's, it's more like they just don't like it. That's interesting though. Um, that's really interesting. Um, I, I don't want to get too religious here with, with everybody, but um, you know, I, I've got a, at least a dozen Bible quotes here that are directly you know, talking about Jesus casting out demons and basically being a necromancer. About 23, I think. So it, it never ceases to amaze me that, you know, the U.S. society, uh, the country who, who, who's a Christian society has completely blown that off. You know, yeah. it doesn't exist. It's like they totally ignore it. You know, yeah. 23 times it appears in the Bible that Jesus drove these things out. Mm -hmm. And the person returned to normal. And, and now it's like, oh, no, that's not scientific. Uh, we're not going to listen to that. Uh, you know, it's like, what's going yeah. on here? Well, it definitely makes me think, wait a minute, baptism involves water, too. Uh, you know, back when you didn't have a violet ray device, uh, maybe this water therapy was really the only way to do that. Um, I, I, I personally, I'm working, my next book is, is loosely called The Technology of Belief. And I, I really think that that this has a lot to do with it is, is how we approach these things or, or, or what we're thinking, what we're believing inside. Um, toxemia, sorry, I'm waiting for a truck to drive by. Uh, toxemia uh, or blood poisoning was also looked at as an early possible cause. It, it's been proven that it's actually not. However, a lot of anyone that has like a bad tooth decay um, would end up in Wicklin's office because the, it, it's, Again, coming back to this egoic shields, if you think about what a, what a toothache does, what a rotten tooth does, it, it really erodes your shields. It really drops you down, and it would seem like a perfect avenue. where It brings your energy could, level down, too. Yeah, so, that, so that it would open, open you up, open your doors up, basically, uh, to another form of attack. Um, so much That's of, what I see with a lot of schizophrenics. If you go into with the prisoners... <laughs> They would do all these horrible things. I mean, I wouldn't look at their records unless I had to because it would yeah. bias me. Yeah. But the ones I did, the schizophrenics, I mean, they would do these horrible things. And then I would look in their background and the trauma that they faced growing up was horrendous. Mm -hmm. It was absolute. They were burned. They were tortured. They were uh, neglected. They were not all of them, but... A, a great number of them. So there was that damage there. Mm -hmm. you know? And it seems like these entities would, uh, were like sharks smelling blood. They could smell that and they would move in. Yeah. yeah. And if you look at both world wars, if you look at any kind of uh, armed conflict like that, you're basically inducing that trauma that's going to last for not just a lifetime, but it's going to be epigenetically installed. Uh, you're going to have kids that are suffering from that. You're going to have grandkids that are still suffering from that, from that unresolved trauma. If you were to look at this ritual of circumcision, all of these things would cause this uh, massive psychic trauma that could occur that could really open us up to really any kind of attack possible. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. I was wondering, do you, do you want me to take you into that, that one case where they pretty much took over that person or not? Sure, yeah. Okay. So th this is, th this is a uh, write-up <clears throat> from uh, a case that came to the uh, – I was working psych crisis um, at Keno Hospital in Tucson. This was on June uh, 7th, 2007. 
So what I did is, is in, interspersed within the, this, this story are uh, patterns that these voices run, but I'm going to skip over those and just read the story. And then if we have time, we can go back into the patterns. Okay. Otherwise, it'll break up the story too much. So it was like uh, June 7, 2007 at 9.30 p.m. I was in, in the Keno Hospital ER reading the admission documentation on a Benjamin Farsi. An hour prior, the police had forcibly dragged uh, him into the hospital ER. The intake paperwork contained a brief statement from his father. It said, for over a month, my son's been insisting that he is someone else. When I call him by his name, he gets angry and starts yelling that he is not our son. He says he's not Benjamin, but someone called Randall Garland. When I called him by his name, he sucker punched me and threatened to kill the family. I said, I looked, uh, I looked over his toxicology report and he had no drugs on board. And then a nurse came in and said his father was in the uh, waiting room and wanted to speak to me. So uh, I went out there and, and found the father. He was a Middle Eastern man, you know, kind of balding, dark skin. Uh, and his, his expression looked kind of grave. Uh, and I was sick of being stuck in the ER. There was a picnic table outside of the ER. So I asked him, I said, come on, follow me out here and let's go sit down. I told him, uh, we sat down and I asked him, okay, tell me what's going on. And he had a, he had a fat lip. He had a swollen lip. And he said, uh, he said, tonight he crossed the line. He sucker punched me in the face and threatened to kill my family. Uh, he said, I don't think he was on drugs because he's been continually locked into the apartment. He hasn't left the apartment. Uh, but I know he's been using meth in the past. All right, so he, right away, you know, here the shield broken down. Um, so he, he said he didn't know anybody here. Uh, and and he, did, he couldn't have got out to, without them noticing. So I asked him, when did all this start? And he said, uh, when we were in California. So they were living in California. And he said, I noticed uh, something wasn't right with Benjamin. He was distant, couldn't hold a job. He got into arguments with all his bosses. He got into arguments with his father. Uh, he said, a few months ago, his father said, I found a job here in Tucson and moved the whole family out here. Um, and Benjamin stayed behind with his girlfriend, even though he didn't have a job. And he, he said something interesting. He said, as we were leaving, he showed the uh, emotions of a dead fish. He, he didn't seem to care. He, he, he was just cold and, and when we pulled out he showed no emotions. Uh, since he, he couldn't hold a job he ended up staying in the apartment with his girlfriend all day and she, while she worked and then she came home at night and uh, he had no money. Uh, she threw him out eventually. So they, they were fighting. So his father sent him a bus ticket to come to Tucson. And when he got here, he said he was distant, he was irritable. Um, and he, he uh, they brought him into the house. He started arguing with his big brother, Jason, who was a good bit bigger than he was from what I understood. And when the father tried to get him to help out around the house, you know, he went, screw you, uh, you know, he, he'd blow him off, he wouldn't do it. Um, and then he, he, he got really pissed off. And then he started walking up to his father and swinging at his face with his fist. But just stopping short of hitting him you know when he got up and he started doing that over and over and over again um and when the big brothers caught him doing that once he grabbed him threw him up against the wall and said you know if you you hit my father i'll kill you, you know? so um <clears throat> benjamin got in, a, in an argument with his father uh, and his father said he didn't remember what the argument was about but that um when he told Benjamin, no, you can't do that, Benjamin jumped up, started screaming and ranting and, and started yelling uh, that he wasn't Benjamin, that he was Randall Garland, and to stop trying to convince him that he was somebody, uh, somebody else or, or he would kill his father. You know, so he, he's like, you know, um, but since he didn't actually do anything, since he, he didn't actually hit the father or do any damage to anybody in the family, they kind of blew it off, you know, kind of, okay, so he didn't, he didn't do anything. And, and I remember him telling me, he said, uh, I don't know what's gotten into him. And, and when you think about a statement like that, you know, it, it's like something has gotten into him or you know, the devil made me do it. It's like there's this unconscious awareness that something else is driving the behavior. 
So I asked the father, I said, how long has he been that way? And he said, uh, for a few weeks and he's getting worse. Um, he, he said that this evening he went into the living room and that the guy made a total mess of the place. Uh, and he said he'd never cleaned up after himself. And then he said, uh, he called Benjamin. He said, Benjamin, I want you to clean this mess up right now. And Benjamin went off and started screaming at him. He says, I'm not Benjamin. And he started screaming that over and over again. And he said the whole family ended up in the living room trying to reason with him. Uh, he said the harder we tried, the madder he got. And he said his little daughter uh, was there too. And she was holding a pet chick that they'd bought for her. She was apparently a little gal. He said Benjamin screaming scared it and it fell onto the floor. Benjamin reached, reached down, grabbed the thing, ripped its head off and threw it at the little girl's feet. And she was just screaming bloody murder for hours. And then his, uh, his older son grabbed Benjamin and pulled by the hair and started smashing his head against the floor. Um, and as it said, the father said, I was afraid he was going to kill him. His wife was screaming and they, they tried, the father tried to break him up. And um, Jason, the, the brother, dragged Benjamin into the bedroom, slammed the door, told him if he came out, he would kill him. Right. So uh, <clears throat> after, after a couple of hours, uh, Benjamin started pounding on the, on the walls in, in the room. And uh, they could hear him walking around in there talking to somebody, even though they knew there was nobody in there with him. And the longer he stayed in there, the more agitated he sounded uh, and kept pounding on the walls until his father heard him actually punching holes through the wall, wallboard, and the pieces falling on the floor. So he ran into the uh, bedroom and he goes, Benjamin, stop. And Benjamin came up to him and did the same thing, only this time he punched him in the face and knocked him down. All right. So he was on the ground and he said, uh, when I got up, he tried to hit me again. And he kept yelling, I'm not Benjamin. Benjamin's dead. He said, he died a long time ago. Why can't you get it through your damn thick skull that Benjamin is dead? And then he said, now get out of my house, all of you, or I'll kill you. So he's threatening to kill the whole family. And he, he took a step toward uh, the guy's wife and the father grabbed him, wrestled him down to the floor. And I remember him telling me, he said he was a, a lot stronger than I, could, I gave him credit for. Now, that's one thing consistent, too. These guys, when they get angry, they are supernaturally strong. I've watched them toss a, a, you know, two prison guards around the inside of a prison cell like a bubble gum. And I, I've got some stories about that that'll send chills down your back. But that, that's another consistent thing. It's like they get the energy from somewhere else. It's not it's supernatural almost. So uh, his son came in and pulled, uh, uh, pulled him off him and started beating him. And he was afraid that the, the older son would kill him. So he, he called the police and he was feeling real guilty about that. I told him, you did the right thing. Um, and then I asked him, I said, have you spoken to his girlfriend? And he said, yeah, I called her the other day and we talked for a good, good while. And he, he said, I got her number here. I think it's better if you call her. And he wrote down the number on a scrap of paper. So uh, I, I sent him back to the waiting room and I went to my office and called her. And uh, I didn't want Benjamin to see us together because uh, he, he'd, he'd probably go off. So the, the girl's friend's name was Sheila and I, I called her up and uh, the, the, basically the story I got from her is that uh, they moved in together into Sheila's one bedroom apartment and it wasn't long before they started having trouble. He couldn't hold down a job. He was grumpy. He was irritable. Um, he was strapped for cash and he was basically living off of Sheila. He was isolated all day, which is really bad for these people because then the voices just have them all to themselves to bang on him all day. And uh, she would come back. Uh, he couldn't sleep at night. He was pacing the floor. He slept all day. Uh, when Sheila pressured him to get a job, he just went off like a firecracker and started screaming. Um, and she backed off thinking, well, maybe if I, I'm supportive of him and, and give, him, give him some time, he'll get a job. But that didn't happen. His temper just grew worse and worse. Uh, she started feeling like she was walking on eggshells around this guy. And he was relegated to sleeping on the sofa. She would lock her, her bed at night. She started thinking seriously about asking him to leave. Uh, but she was afraid about uh, how he'd react because his temper was so volatile. Uh, and, you know, every day she'd return to her apartment at night, exhausted from work. The shades would be drawn. Uh, the sink would be full of dirty dishes and the apartment would be a mess. You know, so uh, she, he wasn't, you know, 
he wasn't responding to her complaints. Finally, she got fed up and suggested that he might be more comfortable in his own apartment, but he pleaded for her to stay and she felt sorry for him. So she was thinking, well, okay, I'll let him stay till he finds a job and then I'll ask him to leave. Uh, and uh, he promised to do better and look for a job and, and clean up the apartment, and which he did to some degree. Uh, but he, he reverted back to the way he was. He didn't look for a job. He didn't clean up. Uh, and he, he had this, she, she sensed this thinly veiled resentment toward him. And uh, <clears throat> at night, he, she could hear him pacing back and forth outside the, her bedroom door. Uh, she, she locked it and he was mumbling to himself. Uh, so one night uh, she was jarred awake when he opened, uh, he, he was arguing with somebody in the living room loud. And uh, she looked at the clock, it was like three in the morning. She's going like, well, who did he let into the house at three in the morning? Uh, so she got up and, and the, the springs on the mattress squeaked and Benjamin shut up. He went silent. The, the, the talking stopped. So she opened the door and here's these burnt cigarette butts there in the living room smelled of stale smoke. And uh, he's, the television and the radio were off. So those weren't, those weren't the cause of the voices. She saw that the phone was on the hook on the other side of the room and Benjamin was standing there staring at her. So she walked across to the TV and she put her hand on top of the TV uh, to feel if it was warm and it was off. And she asked him, she said, who are you, who are you talking to? And he said, well, the neighbors are fighting again. And she said, uh, I don't think so. It sounded like you were the one that was fighting. And he said, I yelled at the cat. He jumped on the, ca on the table. So j just go back to bed and leave me alone. Uh, <clears throat> so after she determined it wasn't coming from the television, she went back to her bedroom and locked the door. And she could hear him whispering under his breath out there, you know, like cursing and whispering under his breath. And he was pacing back and forth. Um, and she, you know, she was looking at the crack under her door and then she heard uh, the kitchen cabinet open and shut and then the front door open and, and slam shut. And she heard him walking outside and she's going, where's she going three in the morning? So she went to the bedroom window and she opened up the curtain. She's looking out there and she sees him walk out to the middle of a patch of grass and he starts slamming his fist into, he kneels down and starts slamming his fist into that patch of grass. And he's repeatedly doing that until she caught the glimmer of something in his hand. And, and she, she saw in the dim light that it was her butcher knife. And this guy was up there jamming that butcher knife, plunging it into the sod over and over again. Um, so she, you know, she freaked out and she locked her apartment door, called 911, called the police. And, uh, you know, he came back up and he started wiggling the doorknob and, and started yelling for her to let her back in. He, she wouldn't. She said, go away. I've called the police. You, you've, you've got problems. Uh, you know, leave here. The police are on their way. Um, so he, you know, lights came on at the apartment and uh, he ran. So I pulled, uh, I pulled Benjamin into my office. I wanted to talk to him personally and sat him down, said, make yourself comfortable. I asked him, I said, what happened tonight? He said, the police brought me in. He was very calm about that. He just, police brought me here. I said, why? He said, I got into an argument. I said, with your father? And he screams out, he goes, no, he's not my father. These people have been harassing me for months. They won't leave me alone. They follow me around trying to convince me that I'm their son. I can't get it through their heads that Benjamin is dead. He died long ago. I'm Randall Garland. And I said, well, then who's Benjamin? He said, I knew Benjamin when we were in kindergarten. We were in the same class, but he died in class. And I asked him, how did he die? He said, a kid came to our school one day with a gun and he shot Benjamin in the head. The bullet went through Benjamin's head and killed Marcy. The bullet hit the teacher and stuck in his arm. Marcy and, De and Ben are both dead. And I asked him, I said, well, when was Randall born? He said, June 7th, 1972. And I said, well, when was Ben's birthday? And he looks up, he cocks his eyes upward, and he says, uh, September 28th, 1972. And uh, strangely enough, that matched what his, his birthday was. And I asked him, I said, well, where was Ben born? He said, San Antonio, Texas. I said, well, where was Randall born? He said, Boston, Massachusetts. And I said, uh, I'm confused. How did, how did people get so confused about who you are? And he said, Ben and I switched name tags in school. The day he was killed, I was wearing his name tag and he was wearing mine. When he was shot, he had my name tag on 
and they thought that I was Ben, but I'm not. These people called the police and tried to get them to convince me that I'm Benjamin. He said, now I'm really pissed off. <clears throat> so I, I had him thrown into the psych ward and, and uh, uh, locked up there. But this shows you the end result. You know, when they get, that's where they're going. You know, they want that much control. Mm -hmm. They want the victim to believe that they are somebody else. You know? yeah. And I have little doubt that this guy probably would have stabbed his girlfriend had, uh, had she not locked the door and called the police. Yeah, she, she kept telling him he wasn't who he believed he right. was. That, that was in a full I don't think she told the girlfriend that, but she told the father that. Mm -hmm. you know, but, but when he pulled out that butcher knife and started plunging it into the ground, she was in grave trouble. Yeah. So this is where it would end up. And, and I've seen so many in the state hospital that they were so burnt out, you know, that they were just like a hollow shell like you were talking about. You know, they were just walking around and they had what they called the Thorazine shuffle. Mm -hmm. uh, so these voices are extremely dangerous and they don't just hit schizophrenics. They hit us all. Mm. You, know, uh, you know, everybody's had times where they're walking around and then out of thin air, here comes this horrible thought that just comes out of nowhere. Something that you would never act on. Something that just shocks you to the core. Like, how could I possibly have a thought like that? I mean, it's just you're shocked that it even crossed your mind. You know, that's them. Yeah, those are, th those are, I, I write about that in the prana economy, which is this idea that if you're walking around with this, this happens to me sometimes. I'll remember something I did in high school and I'll be like, oh, I'll, I'll like, I'll yeah. shock. I'll, I'll have a jolt right. of that. Right. And, and I look at that as your egoic shield has been hit <laughs> and, and luckily you're recovering from it. Like the fact that you feel bad and you're like, oh, I can't believe that, that's a good reaction. It, it's uh -huh. when we carry that guilt, when we carry the, the shame of it and hold it secretly and hold it in private. What's really happening is we're picking at that scab and we're opening our, well, you know, they're, they're picking at that scab. Yeah. <clears throat> and every time they pick, every time you run into a similar situation, that yeah. button is pushed, that negative emotional energy is generated and they come and they dump on the gas saying, whoever triggered that, mm -hmm. they're to blame, attack them. Yep. And then if you do that, that just intensifies the situation. So they're, they're, they're pushing those buttons and pouring gasoline on the fire to generate that negative emotional energy that they feed off of. And they're doing it to us all. So there's a lot to learn from schizophrenics. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. They have a lot to teach us. But, you know, psychiatrists, you're, you're crazy. You're nuts. You, you got nothing to say about your condition. We'll tell you what's wrong with you. You listen to us and you take these meds and, and uh, that's, what, that's what the treatment is. They haven't done one study on these voices, not one. Mm -hmm. They've just out of nowhere just, oh, well, we think they're uh, hallucinations because they don't make any sense to us. So they're hallucinations. Well, it could be even worse than that. It could be that there are people that study this all the time that, that know how this technology works perfectly well. It could be that there's a certain ceremony such as laying in a coffin at a three, two, two ceremony at Harvard and confessing all of your, your, your sexual sins to a group of people as they watch over you. This could be some sort of ceremony where you're opening your, your egoic defenses and you are allowing a possession to, to enter you. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but if you look at just how well uh, the, these, these dynamic forces run things, they're always at the top, that it, it would seem to be almost naive for us not to at least consider the possibility that these possessions could be happening on a professional installed uh, program, much like you would administer a vaccine. Uh, anyone who wants to be in charge of our world is going to come through an elite Ivy League school. And out of that Ivy League school, there's going to be a secret society that you enter. And inside that secret society is a ritual. And that ritual could electromagnetically open up uh, some sort of doorway or some sort of channel where these, these creatures enter. It, it would explain why there's been such a systematic attack over our treatment of these situations. We're not treating them. We're, I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're managing them. 
And I know that m no one cares more than the people that are in the trenches fighting this. I know that no one, no one's willing to sacrifice more, but their hands are completely tied and it's always tied by someone above them. Just like the demons, it's always tied by someone above their chain of command that they don't even get to see. They're just told this is not how we do things. Well, that's that's usually it's uh, psychiatry. <clears throat> and, and, you know, that triggers the memory of one time I was working at uh, uh, one of the psych hospitals and um, it had been taken over by a private corporation. And the, the, in, the patients themselves were doing, they got together and they were doing this exorcism on this other patient which was interesting. And one of the nurses saw that and just kind of turned a blind eye. When psychiatry found out, they fired her. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you will not let this kind of stuff go on yep. in our institutions. You know? That's exactly <clears throat> what got me fired. And it was weird because the guy that fired me was a former patient at this place and had a very different approach. He was very much wanted to run it like a prison. And it, it, it just only now, man, I, I wish, I wish I would have had your, your wisdom <laughs> when I was that, when I was in that position, I, I just, no, I, no, you, no, you don't, <laughs> no, you don't, because they would have beat the crap out of you like they did to me. Yeah. Well, I would, I would get assaulted all the time because this is a wilderness program. And even though I had the 11 to 14 year olds, sometimes I would be with the 15 to 17 year olds. And those guys are, th those are big guys. No, no, I was talking about administration. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they would go after you. They would not permit anything that w wasn't in their mindset. And you can trace that all the way back to the ivory tower. Oh my you know, goodness. They're training psychiatrists. This is the way it is. This is what it is. It's a chemical imbalance. And they're still saying that, even though, like you said, there is not one iota of proof of it, but you've, Go to their advertisements right now for these different antipsychotic drugs. Oh, it's believed there's a chemical imbalance of the brain. There's not one iota of evidence for that at all, nor is there any evidence that it's genetically transmitted. I know? can't believe that this just, this just hit me. One of our counselors told my group that they, should, that they should be very careful for me because I was working against God, that I was some sort of demonic force. And I hate to say it, but hearing all we're talking about now, it could very much be that that, that guy was suffering his own uh, kind of demon possession because the wow. fact that he would tell my kids, 11 to 14 year old, tell 11 year old that's living out in the wilderness that his only hope, his only safety net is the devil. I mean, that's some serious messed up. My a counselor kids, said that? A counselor said that. Oh my God. Only now is this hitting me. Am I remembering this? One counselor wanted me fired right away. This other counselor was telling my kids that I was this demonic spawn and that yeah, they you were a threat. Yeah, Again, you were a threat. Over the target. Probably so. This has been awesome. I, I don't want to end this, but you know, we have to because it's, it's, it's the two hour limit. So um, let's wrap it up. So, so we have something that's digestible. Um, is there anything else you want to say or, or, or talk about right now, Jerry? Well, I, I think I'd just like to reiterate that we're all under attack by these things, that you are not your thoughts, that you are the person watching the thoughts. You're the one listening to those thoughts and to watch those things come into your mind. You know, and, and you know, the only time you can live is in the present. And these things are constantly dragging you into the future and into the past. And every time they do that, they're creating this anxiety. What's going to happen next? You know, what, look at all the rotten things you did in the past. You know, we can only live in the present, but that voice that's in our head, constantly speaking, that's not who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's what they invade. They invade your thought stream and they'll throw something in there. And I catch myself all the time. Here's this, rotten thought comes in there and I go, you, you know, this doesn't belong to me. Get out, you know, leave, leave now. You know? So you, you have to watch your thoughts and, and back away from them because it's, it, they're self-reinforcing. They, you know, they'll tell you the same story over and over and over again. And when they're done, every, the world is the way you think it is. You know? But that's just your story. You know, that's not the truth for anybody else. That's just your story. And if you try to break that, there's this, all this, static that happens they don't want you to break that you know they don't want you to look outside of that it really does boil down to am i sovereign 
that when, right. when you say, am I sovereign, you were creating electromagnetic cymatic pattern in your brain. I know it sounds crazy, but you are, you're creating this thought pattern that's going to have a certain electromagnetic charge. And for whatever reason, that's a built-in walking Tesla violet ray. We never actually explained that. A violet ray is, is really simple. It's basically a static device that, that's, that's emanating static electricity. It's no different than when you see that every president goes to Saudi Arabia and touches their hand on this static device and their, and their hair goes up, which makes you wonder about that too, by the way. But uh, it, we have the power to electromagnetically create the patterns in our brain through, through our uttered speech, through Psalm 23, through am I sovereign? So we have the ability to, to take this on. It doesn't require a pill that's given to us by someone else. Not that I'm bashing pharmaceuticals because that's the exact opposite of what I want to do here. These are tr proven, proven. Well, to well, there there are some, right? there's a lot of patients you cannot even reach unless they're on those meds. Yeah. You know, you, you can't even reach them. So once they're on those meds, then you can reach them. Mm -hmm. So the, the meds are important but they yeah. shouldn't be kept on them because they destroy the patient. They destroy their nervous system. They, they should be used to calm the patient down so you can reach them. Mm -hmm. And then once the voices are taken on, then they need to be taken off. So, you know, there's so many I couldn't reach uh, unless they were on meds and, uh, and several I couldn't reach even so. I mean, they were so far gone, they were unreachable. Yeah. I think right now that the newest wave of this that's happening is people that, that feel like that they have an implant that's been placed inside of them. I only say this because I've been getting a lot of these people that contact me personally. And uh, please, everyone know I'm, I'm not a medical uh, whatever. I have no experience at all except for what I told you. I was even fired, so that should show you. <laughs> but, but I always come back with it's because they don't have sovereignty over their own body. They, they, they literally feel as above, so below. There's an implant in me. That implant really could be this this you know, demon force, this type of possession. And that's why it really comes down to, am I sovereign? Can I prove my sovereignty? Um, if it starts there, um, I, I think that's your best bet to, to trying to, uh, you know, keep yourself safe and, uh, and get us back to health. Well, yeah, realize they're out there. There are forces out there <clears throat> that are independent of us that are trying to, you know, hijack you drive you in a negative direction i mean they, and they are not of you and and they insert thoughts constantly into your mind and these thoughts are usually negative lies you know about yourself or somebody else you know, if you need to be on the watch for that yep man is not a cancer on this earth you are the living soil you you were supposed to be here the earth you were a reflection of the earth you were the blue whale of the walking land don't let them drop your shields, man. Don't let it happen. Uh, we're 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 gonna we're gonna we're gonna take care of this anyway. Final words, Jerry. Uh, no, I appreciate uh, you letting me come on, and I uh, I appreciate all the listeners because you guys are the ones that are going to have to spread this information because it's certainly not going to be done by psychiatry or the ivory tower. They're going to suppress this stuff. You know, they're making $3.6 billion a year selling antipsychotic drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's a real big disincentive to find a cure for one of the top 10 maladies on the planet. You know, they, uh, <clears throat> they're, they're not going to want this out. It's you guys that are going to have to get it out through the underground, through talking to one another, uh, through underground media. Uh, if anything, they're going to suppress this stuff. Mm -hmm. So those of you who have the light to see and can, can hear this stuff, I'm verifying that it's true. And there's a lot of people who work in mental health that, that feel like, oh, yeah, there's something else going on here. There's, th this person is possessed, but they won't allow themselves to think that way because the whole system is, is set up to blow that off, to, mm -hmm. to, to negate that. But they feel it. They sense it. You know, if families with schizophrenics, they sense that there's something else there. And I'm here to tell you there is. Right on. You'll see down in the comments, there's, there's links to some of these books we discussed. These are other, other experts, um, some not as qualified as Jerry, but are still saying the exact same thing. So I encourage you that if you have any doubts about this, check out those articles, check out those books. Uh, you'll, you'll see links to the Freeman TV interviews, which are fantastic with Jerry and Sherry. Um, and we're going to sign off for now, but, uh, but thanks a lot for listening.
Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jerry.